so much for joining our coffee chat uh, session. It's going to be a really informal session, but I think the discussion will be really engaging and thought provoking. We've got a great panel uh, up, lined up tonight. Before we kick off, we've got one another prize on offer to reflect on throughout the coffee chat. And the question is, how many organizational members does AXA have? So put your answers in the chat and the close person, closest person will win a fantastic prize. Um, I'd like to begin the conversation by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all joining from today. For those of us in Eastern and Inner Sydney, it's on the lands of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and we extend our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. As a quick introduction, my name is Erin, and I'm the chair of the Australian Citizen Science Association. Most of us were in the previous session, but before I begin, I'll just remind everyone that we have a code of conduct governing our online event, and there's more information online. And also a reminder to everyone that the session is being recorded. So for those of you that don't want to be uh, seen, please uh, turn off your video and remain on, on mute. And this session will be available shortly on AXA's YouTube channel. Also, uh, the panelists welcome any comments, so please put any comments you might have for Joe, Adrian, Jeff in the chat function, and we'll read those out uh, throughout the, the chat. And just one final uh, acknowledgement of tonight's session sponsors, which is the Mindaroo Foundation's Fire Fund Initiative. So thank you to them. So I'd now like to introduce Dr. Jeff Garrett, who will be facilitating the coffee chat session. Jeff, as many of you know, is AXA's patron, and he's been incredibly instrumental in helping AXA make valuable connections and partnerships since joining our team. Uh, Jeff was the former Queensland Chief Scientist and also the former head of CSIRO and CSIRR, CSIR in South Africa. And Jeff, we're so appreciative of all the work that you do on our behalf. So welcome. Thank you, Aaron. It's a great pleasure. I don't I'd also like to introduce our two panel members. We have Joe White, who's the Director of Science, Education and Conservation, the Australian Institute of Botanic Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney. Joe has over 25 ex years experience of state, in state government, uh, operating at a senior officer level in the areas of science leadership, environmental management, policy development and program delivery. Joe is also a great champion of citizen science, and she's created a lot of capabilities in citizen science and social research. Joe's full bio is uh, on our website, so please visit it for more information on Joe. I'd also, like to welcome, well, I'd also like to welcome Adrian Turner. Adrian is the Chief Executive Officer of the Mindaroo Foundation Fire Fund Initiative. Adrian is an experienced corporate leader and has a strong track record of building innovative companies and organizations to tackle complex challenges. At the Mindaroo Foundation, Adrian is the CEO of the Fire Fund Initiative, which was established in January 2020 of this year with a commitment from Andrew and Nicola Forrest. And the collaborative initiative aims to see Australia become a global leader in fire and flood resilience by 2025. Previous Adrian was the CEO of CSRO's Data61 and for more information on Adrian, please visit the AXA website as well. But welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Jeff, I'll now turn it over to you to, to lead the informal chat on resilience. Thanks again, everyone. Right, thank you, Erin, very much indeed. Um, right, everybody, as Erin said, the I word is very important, it's informal, and we'll be looking forward to uh, uh, putting our panelists on the spot with some uh, pithy questions as we go along. Uh, so let's rock and roll. Um, let me out front first congratulate Erin and the team for the splendid work that they're doing. I've been involved with them the last uh, uh, few years. I was a late starter, but I just think they're doing fantastic stuff. And, and this, this month's events are a testimony to that and, and tonight's thing too. And thank you, obviously, to the sponsors. So over the course of the next uh, 30, 40, 40 minutes, we'll over this cup of virtual coffee and even a virtual cake, if we're lucky, uh, dig into this concept of resilience. I'm sure we've all heard uh, the word used a lot. In fact, I can't seem to pick up a, a journal or a newsletter without the R word just bouncing out at you. Uh, so it's you know very um, uh, very important, very popular word. Um, um, we'll get into the, the definition, but it's commonly defined as a capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, um, setbacks, and to be able to adapt and move forward. Um, but it's a lot more than just bouncing back. It's that capacity to 
absorb uh, disturbance and uh, reorganize and keep functioning so that we can be better prepared in the, in the future. But there's a lot of words, a lot of stuff being written. What does this mean in practice? And I think what we want to try and do tonight with our uh, two distinguished colleagues uh, is to dig into that. What does it mean in practice, whether it's for nations, whether it's for organizations that we're working in or for individuals um, and our families. Um, so we'll explore resilience, not in terms, not only in terms of disaster res of preparedness and recovery, but around the individual. Um, how does it work? How can we be better? How can we help other people um, in that space? Um, and we'll try and draw some lessons um, from the discussion over the next while that can help us with our individual and uh, team responsibilities going forward. Um, and as I said, as we go along towards the end of the session, we'll open up for questions, which Erin will be stage managing. Um, and before we do start, I'd like to make a special reference to uh, a, a really good online resource that I'd recommend to you all. Uh, earlier, Erin and I interviewed a very distinguished Indian uh, international scientist, a good pal of mine, Dr. Ramesh Mashelka, about resilience and why he describes himself as a, a dangerous optimist. Um, he was previously Director General of India's CSIR uh, with over 14,000 um, uh, staff. Uh, he's only one of a handful of Indian scientists in the last 100 years who's a fellow of the Royal Society of London. He's a former president of the Indian um, National Science Academy and was president also of the Global Institution of, uh, of Chemical Engineers. And interestingly, intriguingly, um, around his reputation, he's uh, got an honorary doctorate from 42 universities around the world. Interesting number if you're a Douglas Adams fan. Um, he's passionate uh, in the topic of resilience, and we know the challenges in uh, India at the moment. We talked to that. Um, and so do tap into Access Online event webpage when you have a spare 15 minutes or so for an absorbing and thought-provoking discussion with a very wise man. But now, straight on to a couple of our own passion authoritative colleagues on this really important uh, topic. So welcome again to Joe and Adrian. Um, so my job is I've got a sort of uh, Lee Sales, Oprah Winfrey hat on, trying to uh, draw them out and interrogate them and provoke them with the nicest, smallest pea uh, to, to share their wisdom uh, with us this evening. Um, so kicking off, and we'll take it in turns, and hopefully, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron, that... Uh, Joe and Adrian will uh, also ask each other questions. That's the intent. So this year has really been a true test of, uh, of resilience. I mean, the question one, really. I read recently that how we navigate a crisis or a traumatic event, recognising that both bushfires and coronavirus have, have many characteristics of, of trauma because they're unpredictable and they're uncontrollable and they depend in a large part how as individuals or groups of individuals, communities, of nation, um, uh, how resilient we are. Would you agree with that, that there's a very strong uh, relationship between resilience and our uh, reaction and response to the traumas that we've seen over the last while? Joe, let me, ladies first, uh, what's your thoughts there? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm, I might start by saying I'm, I'm not a qualified psychologist, but I do have been a leader for, for, for many years and um, working in the environment space throughout my career. <laughs> and I lo love reading around leadership and psychology. So I'm sure that'll influence my answers. Uh, so yes, I agree um, that uh, yeah, certainly a very challenging year and how we're resilient we are is influenced by how we, we navigate these traumatic or crisis events in our life. Um, I think quite central to it is um, how we perceive um, how we perceive things. So central to resilience is our perception, and do we conceptualise of the event as traumatic or as an opportunity to, to learn and grow? And um, some talk about it as bouncing back, but there's a bit of a, a view at the moment about how do you bounce forward. So I think uh, we can make ourselves more or less vulnerable in how we think about um, the event or crisis that we've been been working within and it's very much around that that mindset um, I wouldn't trivialize obviously where people are coming from in terms of their level of crisis or trauma and at different different times um, people would need to actually go out and seek um, you know professional support and others depending on what what stage they're at within that sort of that cycle um, but yeah I think it's very much around how we perceive it good thank you Adrian kick off kick us off uh, your thoughts to open up yeah, I, I uh, agree with uh, the way that Joe's framed it. Um, just to give some context, 
So there's two lenses that I'll come at this through. Um, one is one is an operating lens and leading team. I've led um, relatively large teams here and in the US um, and spent my career spanning fields of uh, different fields of science, leading uh, Data61, but also in cybersecurity, um, which really I think is a, a field where you're dealing with kind of rapid uh, disruption and, and things to deal with and having to respond. The concept of resilience is something that's um, familiar over the last, last 15 or 20 years. And I also sit on the board of Movember, um, which, hasn't, hasn't, which, which is about to be announced, which is very focused on men's health and wellbeing. Um, the, the only other thing I'd say is, um, building on Joe's work um, and Joe's comments is, Perception and perception is is shaped in in part by our past experiences and the things that we normalize or have normalized for us. And I'll give you an example. Today I was with the uh, deputy commissioner for RFS and the leadership team, and we were talking about um, first responders and how resilient first responders are. And I think in part that's because uh, I'm sure many of us have been exposed to natural disasters and I personally experienced the fires up close, but they're used to doing it day in, day out. And there's a normalization um, that allows them to not dwell on the current situation, but to be able to focus on the positives in the current um, situation and find purpose in what they're doing as well to allow them to focus forward, to be able to bounce forward. Great. Let's um, uh, clear, be clear up front what we're talking about here. And I think it's important to get a, a shared definition. Um, you know, I, I sometimes play the game in the innovation space because there's a lot of uh, different views of that. And if you ask 20 people, uh, give me a pithy definition of uh, innovation, you get 21 different responses. Um, uh, Joe, how would you describe resilience in a serious nutshell? Um, briefly, um, what's your thought? I'm probably not going to help you in this sense because I'm going to give you three. Um, oh, so I think to me, when I was trying to think this through, there are, and, and it probably frames the way we might answer some of the questions or certainly how I'll be thinking about where we go with, with this. There's a psychological view, which is um, around the individual and how the capacity to cope. And I'd add that to, to feel competent. And then I think there's a, a community resilience as another concept, which is around the capacity of that community to um, with respond, withstand and recover um, from adverse situations. And those classically could be, you know, obviously fire, but we, we've, we've got a whole range of different adverse um, uh, disasters, et cetera, we, we, we need to pre prepare for and plan for. And then in terms of the work that um, I've devoted my career to around um, ecology, there's, there's ecological resilience. And um, from that point of view, it's thinking about the, um, uh, how will the, the, the species and the ecosystem um, continue to have, to have structure and function? And how do we ensure, I'm particularly focused on this within work, but how do we ensure that we've actually got genetic fitness or we've got the diversity captured that we, whatever the, the scenario that might play out, we've actually got enough diversity to deal with that. So I'm giving you your three. Um, that's good. And, yeah. Thank you. That's, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, really clear. Um, Adrian, do you have a view in the, uh, what are we talking about business? I do. And, and I'm going to come at it a slightly different way. Um, so, so you kind of abstract away an, an, an equation for resilience um, I think re resilience is uh, about uh, risk reduction, that any sort of um, event, whether it's a personal event, a group event, um, can, can cause lasting harm. And uh, it's about what, what is that event? Um, and um, the second is what's the likelihood of being exposed to that event? Because there could be a triggering event, but you're not in a situation where you're exposed to it in which case it doesn't present that risk. And then vulnerability. So is there some inherent vulnerability? And in, in, it could be 
an ecological vulnerability, it could be a socioeconomic vulnerability, it could be a personal vulnerability based on a past experience that means that if I'm exposed to that particular event, um, then, then the impact of that event is amplified um, by, by vulnerability. Um, that, that's the way I've thought about it, actually, across a whole different lot of environments, um, in, including the Mindaroo work. Good. Um, Joe, let me ask you, you mentioned um, opportunity, um, as well as obviously the challenges. Uh, we know that the uh, Chinese symbol for crisis is uh, made up of two sub-symbols, uh, danger and opportunity. Where, Joe, do you think some of the opportunities lie in, uh, in helping us respond in a resilient way to the crises that we've experienced? Uh, well, I think as, a, um, uh, as an individual, then it's thinking through, um, well, I probably, I probably might really, I'm trying to think, um, there, are, there are different ways individually you can think about it. So it's like if you were thinking about the uh, other new skills that I could be learning as a result of this, does, does a, um, you know, uh, as long as I can think of it, working within government, I've gone through restructures. So back in the day, I started it um, uh, in Victoria, and at one stage we were called um, Conservation Natural Resources, and it got dubbed Constant Name Review because we restructured every year. <laughs> so, so it was uh, within that kind of context of being presented with change. Uh, what were the opportunities within that? And I think if if we even thought about COVID this year. Um, what is the opportunity that it's given us? Well, um, you know, greater time with our families, a greater sense of balance. Um, the opportunity that's that's come for me with my work is I needed to transition a whole workforce from a particular way of being in a really beautiful location to another beautiful location, which is about two hours, uh, not two hours, <laughs> an hour, you know, a, a much longer distance for them to come to work. And um, we actually have leapfrogged uh, a whole transition because people have now been, who've never been able to work from home remotely, uh, who've been based in a collection, the herbarium collection, have now been working that way. So that change now to a new location is not so scary. So um, I think it can be from the individual looking at and, and saying, okay, is there an opportunity in this, this change that's being presented to me? Um, and they're just a couple of, the, a couple of examples. That's good. Adrian, you, you mentioned the importance of, uh, of experience um, and talking individually um, and how, you know, um, sometimes we make decisions framed on experience. My wonderful mother-in-law uh, recently passed away. She was a senior oncologist in, in South Africa, made the observation uh, as she got older that people, as they get older, don't change. They get more so. Um, and you know, that her observation is young people are much more flexible and open to danger and opportunities. W would you see that as a truism that, um, that resilience um, decays as we, as we get older for various reasons? What are your own observations and how you've observed people you work with? Uh, I think, um, I actually don't think that's true. Um, I, don't, I don't see it that way. I think that, um, I think it's a mindset and, and, and the mindset um, of continuously looking for opportunity in the situation that's in front of you is the consistent trait that I've seen in resilient people, regardless of whether they're young or old, um, whether it's, you know, my, my, one of my own parents got, got quite sick and, um, but saw the opportunity and remained optimistic and actually um, got through a situation that on paper they shouldn't have. Um, so, the, you know, demonstrating a tremendous amount of, uh, amount of resilience there. Um, I think that when we're in these times of um, crisis, um, it's not often, particularly in the way that we've moved to this always on, we're always on, we're always, things are, things are being demanded of us that we don't have time to stop. So I think a, a different sort of an appreciation around time and the value of time as you stare down some of these crises that um, can feel like they're existential. Um, and um, to, uh, personally, that, that's been the biggest, I guess, gift in um, what's gone on here over the last 12 months 
Um, you see the background image is um, the property that myself and my two brothers got caught in um, fighting fires for six and a half hours that we shouldn't have got out of. And it, uh, it, 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 it really forces you to re-look re at the quality of time and how, how you're spending time. And that's the, uh, another trait that I've seen in team members that have shown enormous resilience is just the relationship that they have with time is, uh, is very different. Mm. Good. And I'd, I'd probably just add, Jeff, if I can, to what Adrian yeah, said. Certain, I certainly agree. And I think, you know, particularly people who are older have had much more life experience and then they, they can actually um, look at a particular issue and put it in a, in a context and say, okay, well, I, I've lived this and I've, you know, I know this, I can come out the other end. So um, I actually think they're very resilient. Good. Thank you. Spot on. Um, interpret for us um, in real life uh, some of the things that we we read. For example, in August, the federal report into the 2019-20 bushfires was released. And uh, it says that, and I quote, resilience needs to be embedded as an explicit consideration in all future planning, agriculture and urban land use and zoning and investment decisions. Good words. What do you think this means in practice? What does it mean in the areas that you have responsibility and you work in? Um, and particularly what's different now from what we have been doing? Um, uh, so give me some, give us some, some practical guidance. What does that stuff mean in practice as leaders? Joe. Right. Um, well, when I was I was thinking uh, thinking a little bit more on this, I think it's around the, the challenge areas. Basically, we, we we are facing, you know, with with climate change, probably accepting that we do we do need to prepare for a, a range of droughts, um, bushfires, floods, um, poor air quality. There's a whole range of things that we need to, and pe people are really. Um, I think the unprecedented fires have really focused as pe people's minds about how, how critical and real those, those, those issues are. So if I think about it, not, not just within the context of where I'm working, but what that means, um, I think the, that across those different areas um, that are being identified, the risks need to be known and to be factored in, in, term, in terms of how we're planning and working. And um, there needs to be much better sharing of information and making sure information's available um, and building and sharing that knowledge. Um, and we need to be working in a much more integrated way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that's, that's where that, that, um, that part of the bushfire inquiry and recommendations are, are coming to. They're, they're basically, and I think we'd, we'd certainly see that in terms of how we're, we're, we're needing to respond to climate change. Um, so I think that's probably, I might start there. Good. Yeah. Adrian. So Adrian, you've obviously been very close to it personally and also in terms of your uh, job now. Uh, have, have you got some thoughts about it, what it means in practice and how you translate it for, for your troops? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're, we're adopting a missions model to drive excuse me, system, system level changes. So over the case of four, uh, over the period, period of four or five months with a cohort of 55 partners, um, of which AXA is one, we, we built an evidence base to say if resilience is a function of the risk or the hazard exposure to that, which is a lot about landscapes and vulnerability, which is societal and system level vulnerabilities, if you were to define a program of work and drive change in the country, um, where would you focus? And we, we identified a small number of leaders in each of those areas that we felt like if we can drive change in those areas, we drive a step change in, in the resilience for the country. And it spans things from um, at a community level. So we believe all of this ultimately has to be community led is Simple things like like knowledge knowledge, knowledge sharing, um, having um, a view locally about if if you think about now in a post COVID or in a COVID world where economies are investing in the build out of infrastructure, um, if you apply a resilience lens over the, those investment decisions at a community level, the prioritization actually ends up being very different. Um, so. So there's better decision support systems for investments locally. 
but then it's about landscapes. It's about instrumentation of landscapes as well. And thinking about how do you unlock new economic models for uh, um, active land management, including bringing um, indigenous methods to that. And then the, the other piece of this is the hazard itself. And what, what, what we saw was a lot of breakdown in communications. Um, a lot of this is about um, getting the right information to the right people at the right time. And uh, there's a huge, huge amount of work that can be done mm -hmm. there. But uh, we're, we're optimistic about um, progress that can be made. Good. Um, now, with your uh, Fire Funds Resilience Blueprint uh, released in September, uh, is what you're telling us now the essence, the, the framework um, for that blueprint or any other themes that you want to build on? Yeah, look, I, the, the first... To, to give you an example of how we're thinking about solving these problems is, first of all, Mindoro is a philanthropy. Um, it's a $2 billion corpus and it's an impact philanthropy, which is fairly new for Australia in that it's very, very focused on the outcome. Um, and it's not an operator and it's not a research organisation. So it partners with research organisations and operators. But what we can do is get in and drive, um, drive change, drive accelerated change in these areas. So the first mission that we announced was um, Fire Shield, which is the setting an audacious goal and then breaking the problem down and mobilising the best, including citizen scientists, to solve parts of that problem. And so the challenge that we posed was how, how would you put out any dangerous fire in an hour? which sounds like an absurd proposition, but actually if you break the problem down to first order principles, um, we believe we can get there by 2025. And, and it, it means some shifts in the way we manage land. It means some shifts in the way that RFS and emergency services um, operationalize against a hazard. It, it's a shift in the way the communities act, but um, we think we can get there. And, and that's the essence of the program is also leading by example to show the country that there's a different sort of innovation model that we could employ locally at, at a national level to solve the country's wicked problems. And if and when you get it really working, presumably that model and learning is transferable internationally. I have a brother in California recently, you know, uh, an hour or so from being evacuate, evacuated, um, and, but are there any models around the world where people are doing it right and we can learn from? Or are you in new oh, territory? Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we're, we're getting told by people in other countries, including the US, that what we're doing is at first in, in this area, in this field. But uh, as an example of the sort of attention that we're getting, I had um, a conversation in the last 24 hours with Joe Biden's campaign lead for climate and the guy who also is leading the economic recovery plan for California post-fire and post-COVID. Um, and what we're working on is standing up a sister program to our activity in the US so that we have 12 months of continuous um, fire season to yeah. be piloting and testing against. And we've also had have real-time discussions going on with some of the technology companies, including some of the uh, lower earth orbit um, Ge geospatial uh, companies that will just bring a whole new level of um, spatial intelligence and decision support for some of these problems. That's great. Danger and opportunity. Joe, I'm going to move you into um, um, your experience um, working in government. Um, um, and if resilience is the ability to respond quickly to shocks and changes, uh, what's your uh, own experience and observations um, of, uh, of resilience in government. I've often felt that government have two speeds, um, um, glacial and warp speed, uh, nothing in between, uh, sadly. Uh, Joe, do you have some observations there around um, how governments can do it better? If you get a letter tomorrow putting you as the Supreme Commander of the Australian Public Service, uh, what, what would you do differently what would you put in place from your own experience in well, the probably, probably as a career public servant i'm, I'm more i'm more generous <laughs> to the public service in terms of being able to um adapt and change and um 
look, there's always value in terms of the lessons that come from inquiries. So the, the fire inquiries, both at the state and the Royal Commission at a federal level, um, you know, is a, is a rigorous process and it gives an opportunity to, to consider and then, and then shift. Um, as I was saying before, I've gone through a lot of restructuring <laughs> through, through my career and it, it is the way that governments tend to respond. So not just respond, but they're, if they have a particular policy that they want to put in place or a legislative reform or change, you'll see that they will, will re restructure to it. And to that end, um, I'm seeing across the country, and it's, echo, it's happened here in New South Wales, a view of um, establishing a, a new group that is actually uh, helping bring uh, a focus to this and the work going forward in Resilience New South Wales. So um, th they do respond. I know I went on to, a, I've been on a task force and the r very rapid response does, you know, become the central focus. There are hundreds of different projects and actions that are, that are happening. Um, and sometimes they don't necessarily always get um, uh, the focus um, and there is complexity associated with those. So I'm just trying to think through some of the, you know, work that the EPA had, had, had been working on around uh, asbestos and all the whole range of issues about post fire, how you, how you managing within that, within that landscape are complex and they do navigate through that. Um, there is real value, I think, in terms of um, leadership. So even if we looked at some of the models that are coming through from COVID, I think we'd all say that that national leadership that came through them from the national cabinet was very effective, particularly in the very early stages of um, COVID. And um, the, 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 the idea of leader uh, and supported by uh, an expert is another way that the government has moved quite rapidly. Um, and even if I reflected on COVID-19 and how swiftly we had to move from all in to all out um, within mm. a matter of a week and a half, decisions that have might have taken months in the past were just made within hours or minutes. So when it's needed, it can, it can mobilise. Um, and so I do, uh, I do think um, government's got a big role to play and can be um, agile, but I do think we do need partnerships like the, the that I, um, Adrian's been outlining, that where we work in partnership with universities, um, with, with the, the, those sorts of good proposals, it, it, it all works towards the benefit of community. So uh, it's not, not one has to do everything, it's how do you yeah. actually facilitate and make it all work. Good. So I want to move to, to the personal. Let's start with you, Adrian, and I'll ask Joe the same question. Um, and this is looking in the mirror. Would you regard yourself as uh, always having been a resilient person, uh, or has this changed over, over time? Um, how do you how do you feel about uh, that as a as I say looking in the mirror individual about your own resilience? Yeah, I'm resilient. Um, I think I've always been resilient. Um, I think it goes back to some family experiences early on, but uh, I also spent 18 years over in Silicon Valley, and um, all of my career has been spent. Um, I see patterns in things, and I see markets and shifts. Um, usually before others do um, or some others do. So my whole career has been convincing other people around me that the world's going to look different in the near term and um, creating a new business or I've created new markets in my career as well. And um, as an example, I created and started the company that became the global leader in cyber security for securing critical infrastructure um, from satellites to cars to phones to um, every, everything in between. And I remember um, trying to get that business funded and, and I got about 35 no's um, yeah. from very high profile investors um, in the US. And today the cyber security market is a $180 billion global market and growing. Um, at Data61, um, we re reframe that entire business model to be an open innovation model with a single collaboration agreement with 32 unis, about a third of the country's ICT PhDs in scholarship. And that model to convince the CSIRO that it didn't need to do everything internally, that if we, if we partnered and collaborated, we could do more together um, with our university partners. 
was um, something that was recognised by the OECD as a global best practice for a new model. So I, you can't push for change. You can't, in, in a sense, kind of pioneer a different way of doing things, whatever that is, at a, at a team level, organisational level or system level, um, without coming up against a lot of resist, resistance that you have to become resilient to. And Joe, how about yourself? Do you see yourself as a resilient person like uh, Adrian always been one or have you grown into it? Um, I do see myself as a resilient person and thinking about it, uh, I think there's probably early foundations and then you keep developing. So if I, if I, if I draw from where I come from, I grew up on a farm in country Victoria. Um, we, were, we, we did experience drought, you know, you saw sheep dying, got stuck in dams, which was really, really tough. We went through a number of years of drought um, and then there would be floods, there were bushfires. Um, my dad was a member of the Country Fire Association or CFA for five years. So we were part of, you know, we had the fire, fire drill and it was basically, you know, you were on, you know, you, your group was on call. And anyway, so I think some of that uh, early experience and, and dad and the sort of farming sector and that community's view of um, that you will weather it and you'd look forward to the next season and then to the next season. And I think that was quite foundational. Uh, I probably come from the view that resilience is something that um, you can think more around how you perceive things and you can challenge your own mind about whether you're going to be optimistic about it or you're going to dwell on a, on a particular negative way that you could think about it. So I do think uh, the more that you have... Um, different experiences or challenges, uh, the more that they can help reinforce a positive way of thinking in your mind. And I, another, another part of um, resilience can be particularly around finding islands of competence. So we particularly focus on this in, in, in children, but we also do it in terms of how we, we focus on um, developing strength and in individuals in the workforce. So where you've got a great competence, um, the more that you can actually be encouraged and build a great capacity in that space, um, the more you can draw your own strength from it. So, and then you back yourself that yeah. next time I know I can do it because I've done it before. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm sensing from you both uh, that it's not like being born short or born tall or born dark or born fair. Uh, you may feel that you're born not resilient. You're not going to be not resilient for the rest of your life. That you can actually build your resilience. Um, yes. uh, you, you'd agree with that view. Yeah. yeah. Good. And then, how do you how do you help people? In our first presentation early on this evening, Julia uh, mentioned about the importance of the neighbour, um, observing people close to you and your family, maybe, or in your neighbourhood or in your workplace, though where obviously people are struggling. Um, and they're not resilient, how do you, as a leader, go about helping them in their way forward? Uh, Adrian, any thoughts? Yeah, look, I think at some level we're all resilient. I think as a species we're resilient. Um, and I think it's about um, providing context for people um, that, that don't... Because a lack of resilience, some, sometimes it can be a lack of confidence that manifests in um, um, kind of being rattled by um, events or obstacles. Um, but I think it's about providing context. Um, I think it's about taking time to understand each, each of the individual team members um, and helping the team align the, and see themselves in the purpose of whatever, whatever it is that, that the project or the organisation or the team is doing and I think it's about creating a dynamic where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and um, we're also very tribal so a culture where um, there, there's candor um, and it's safe and it's not judgmental for people to put their hand up and say I'm struggling um, I need some help with this uh, and then the other the other thing that has been personally effective for me and um, I'm always supportive of with others in the team is um, particularly as you move to lead large teams, leadership can be pretty lonely. Like it's a pretty lonely job at times. The buck 
the buck stops with you. So one of the things that I think the US and Silicon Valley does particularly well is wrap leaders with support infrastructure. And, and that, that uh, mentors, that's people who have been through similar experiences that can help normalize um, and provide as well, uh, uh, advice to the leader as well. I think it's really important that the leader stay healthy, um, um, both, both in terms of mindset, um, kind, of, kind of all dimensions to, to be there and to, to be present for the team. Um, but I think it's really about drawing out the best in each individual and aligning it to the purpose and having the purpose be bigger than any one individual. Yeah, that's good. We're going to open it up, uh, team. Uh, and Erin, please feel free. I'm going to ask Joe one final question and then uh, get you to, uh, to raise questions that have been, ra uh, been uh, posed. Um, so, Joe, you know, this is run by the Citizen Science Association. You've been very helpful all the way along. Um, how do you think citizen science can play a role in building either individual or um, organisational or landscape level um, resilience? What, what role do you think the, the citizen science community can, can play in enhancing resilience going forward? I think if we, if we look at the individual to start with, uh, we can be thinking about um, well-being and the well-being of the individual. So there are great opportunities in citizen science to... Um, uh, connect. So connections are really important for well-being. Um, so through citizen science, as an individual, you can connect with others. Uh, you can be giving to a bigger purpose and giving is another um, particularly strong part of our well-being. So as an individual, uh, through the opportunity through citizen science, you can actually be uh, fostering um, areas of your own strength and interest, which are good for your well-being. Um, so at that first individual level, there's, there's good things that can come to you from your contribution to something that's bigger and also something that really interests you and connects you with others that have the same interest. Um, probably from a, um, a landscape level, then if we're starting to think about some of the, um, think about some of the ecological challenges that we've got, uh, you can be working towards a much bigger purpose and cause. And I know that that motivates me. So um, uh, as we, you know, work towards, you know, some of the aspirations that Adrian's talked about, uh, certainly from my point of view, the understanding the impact um, on um, vegetation, plant, you know, threatened, threatened species and others at our landscape scale, we can be gathering a lot of really valuable information um, that can be helping equip us uh, in terms of um, understanding what change is happening and what we might need to, to do to make those areas more resilient. Um, but I'm also involved in sort of smart sensing and the idea about being able to bring smart sensors and connecting that with individuals and then how does that feed to sort of very big um, sources of information that can help, yeah. you know, rapidly knowing what's going on uh, in, the, in, the, in response to a crisis and then post-crisis, there's enormous scope. Good. Thank you. Erin, do you want to come in now um, to... Um, to frame for us as we begin to close off um, questions from the audience at large. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. It's been uh, a great discussion and a very active chat. Um, just a reflection we'd love from the panel. It's, um, is it hard to put all the responsibility on one person or community to be resilient? Are they under too much strain? And, and should we rather be asking our government or institutions to lead on resilience? Yeah. Comments, team? Um, I think there are probably mul multiple leaders through, through any particular uh, challenge. It's just, there are just diff different points. But, um, you know, if we thought of co COVID and the response to, to COVID, leadership is so central. So you do need to have a very strong figurehead that is actually delivering you with um, the knowledge so you can actually equip yourself to know how, you want to res how you're going to respond uh, at, at that time. So... You know, it might start from what we're seeing from the Premier or the Prime Minister, but then it flows down to leadership at so many different levels. So I do think it's a shared, it's already quite a shared task. Adrian, yeah, I think, yeah, look, I, I think I, I, my personal view is that you can actually draw a lot of the world's problems right now down to distill it down to this shift that we're going through from industrial era structures to network structures. And if you think about 
all of the major challenges that we're facing right now, they are inherently networked and um, our institutional structures tend not to be and, and our economic structures and incentives tend not to be. And I'm not, don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying in terms of the model for society. I think that um, I'm not advocating a wholesale change to that, but um, in, a, in any network for it to be healthy, each node in that network has to not only consider their own well-being, but the health of the network as a whole, um, as, as well as their own health. And that, that's true in climate, environment. It's increasingly true in commerce um, and the interconnectedness of our economies, geopolitics. Um, you, you could actually, one way to look at the world right now is you could break it down to a series of networks. And if you do that and then you look at how those networks evolving, um, who's responsible, who's influencing, um, what's the role of the individual. What's the, actually, it's a lens that's been helpful to me to get my head around actually the shift that we're going through right now. That's good, thank you. Erin, is there sorry, a last, yeah. Um, yeah. And I couldn't agree more with Adrian with regards to this shift to network, but to reflect on the way the word is being used is something that's really critical. And I'm just coming from the US and seeing the, the, the culturally we share so much with the Australians and the UK and you know, in terms of this independent spirit around withstanding stress and overcoming challenges. There is a danger with the use of the word that we need to be thinking through with regards to the fact that it's, it's focusing on risk and our adaptation to risk rather than not including mitigation. Uh, think about the word recycling and the concept of recycling. Recycling was underscored, supported, and amplified by the petrochemical industry. And it's all, you know, so we have to be careful about how this word is used because it's communicating that it's okay for us to be taking on repeat stress. And we need to be communicating the confidence and our well being to our leaders um, in a top down and a bottom up way that enough is enough. And we need to have that confidence to be able to say it. And right now, the way the word's being used, it doesn't include it. Yeah. Good, thank you for that. Um, so, Erin, we've probably run out of uh, roadway here this evening. Unless there are any uh, uh, big flashing lights from, from your side in terms of a question you'd like to raise with people. Erin? No, I think what Julia chimed in was um, that's been a lot of the chat. Um, well, final question, which should be pretty quick. Any books or resources that the panel might be able to recommend in this area? They're both writing one. <laughs> well, if, if you want to go back to, to, to a good read, I, I was thinking of Fortunate Life by A.B. Facey because there's really somebody who's faced it all and um, it's just such a classic. Um, I don't know. I, I like I like reading things. Um, I've got thirteen things here for mentally oh, mentally strong people. <laughs> if you if you don't mind cognitive behavioural therapy theory, change your thinking. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and another ripper, <laughs> leadership on the line. That's really good too. But cool. um, anyway, they're just a taster. Thank you. There's, there's a lot out there. Adrian, anything from your side on on. Uh uh what you'd recommend to uh, bedtime reading oh look the the one that uh sticks with me that i've read not long ago that i enjoyed a lot was walter isaacson's book on da vinci um yeah. and the reason i like that a lot is is that first of all it's almost <laughs> like where he ended up was it, it, you couldn't have picked it earlier on in his life but he kept on pursuing things of passion and then this mix of um, kind of the creative mind and the creative side with the very logical and mathematical side. And um, I think that we need to value both sides of that um, in society, the, the creativity, particularly as we move to more, you know, data-driven world yeah. and we talk about machines augmenting decisions that we're making. Um, I think it's just so important that we maintain the and value um, creativity in the arts um, alongside these, you know, very, very mathematical-based disciplines and logic-based disciplines. That's good. 
I uh, need to shut us down. I'm getting the signals now. So we've had uh, coffee. It's time for bed, certainly for, for some of us who are coming from the US, Julia, um, back to bed. Um, and well done to Stuart. We're just seeing he's the winner of the uh, of the uh, $50,000 prize sponsored by not sure who. Um, but um, I, I'd like to, on behalf of us all, um, thank uh, AXA again on um, setting this up uh, and to our, uh, our speakers in the first part of the evening, but also particularly to um, to Adrian and Joe for sharing their insights and their wisdom with us this evening. Um, as uh, Aaron shared at the beginning, it's going to be recorded and on uh, AXA's website. Um, so if you need more information, go to citizenscience, or one word, .org .au, And we'll look forward to uh, similar events in the future. So thank you one and all for, for chipping in. Um, and thank you particularly, Adrian and Joe, uh, for sharing. Yeah. Much appreciated. And, and thanks, you, Jeff. thanks to you, Jeff, as well. And can I just say that Mindaroo is thrilled to be a supporter of AXA. And um, thank you to everyone who's here, who you take your own time out to do this um, yeah. and take an interest in citizen science. And uh, we appreciate it deeply. Great. Good luck, everybody. All the best. I'm going to give a shout out to Erin. Thank you so much, Erin. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Erin. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. -bye.